Hey there, good afternoon, good morning, depending where you're joining us from. I am sitting here chatting with Alex Farling and his brand new title, Partner and Community Lead with ScalePad. And you even have the shirt on. To I show do, I have the shirt. They gave me the, they gave me oh. old swag, yeah. yeah. Love it, love it, love it, love it. All right, so we're going to be talking all about the concept of selling your company. Yeah. Uh, obviously, mergers and acquisitions, huge topic. Um, we're going to talk and we're going to dance. We're going to have fun. Uh, but in case people are watching this and they don't know you, they don't know your story, could you introduce yourself and tell us why you and I are talking about mergers and acquisitions? Yeah, today? yeah. Um, mostly because I've done more of them than I knew ever thought I would. Um so Alex Farling, um, I was the co-founder at Lifecycle Insights. Uh, before that, I was an MSP. So I had an MSP. I ran it for 16 and a half years. Same story as, as probably three quarters of the channel, right? We started in uh, 2004 as a break-fix shop. Um, you know, we evolved into managed services in 2008. I grew up a recurring book of business. Um, I thought I would work there my whole life and retire. Um I found a problem in the space while I was still at the MSP and said, you know, we, we have automation everywhere else in our tools, but the account management journey is very manual. We cobble together reports and spreadsheets and pull, tool, pull things from a million different places. So Lifecycle Insights was born as a, as a solution. Um, I remember very distinctly the day I had the conversation with my former business partners there and said, well, look, you know, I'm, I'll help you. I'll introduce you to the space. I'll tell you the problems. I'll show you what's broke, but I don't have time to work there. I got to run this MSP thing. Um, and it just kind of blew up. And while Lifecycle was blowing up, um, my attorney called me and said, hey, I met the guy who's going to buy your IT company. And I said, Brian, you know, COVID just happened. I've got a dry cleaner that hasn't seen a piece of, of uh, hotel linens in, in three weeks. Like he's, he's literally lost 95% of his revenue. Like my books aren't worth what they used to be. It's not how this works. And he says, you pay me a lot of money. Shut up and do what I told you to do. Take the phone call. And so I took the phone call and uh, in, in less than two months, I was gone. I didn't, didn't work at the MSP anymore. And my partners at Lifecycle said, hey, you know, we're busy. We need people. Get your get your butt over here. And, oh, uh, and so I came on board, uh, you know, working with Lifecycle Insights as the channel chief, um, took that to market. We ran it up uh, through, for about three and a half years and uh, and then just had a successful exit to, to ScalePad. So um, love it. it's been a whirlwind of a journey. Um, I still haven't taken a vacation after selling the MSP. And everybody tells me I should have done something nice for myself now for selling, if, you know, selling the, uh, the software company. But uh, I, workaholics don't take days off, I guess. I think you need to at least schedule some kind. Wait, I'm going to take some time like off. A wedding? You have a wedding coming up, right? We haven't really put a date on that yet. We'll okay. that. But I do have some time off. I'm taking, uh, I'll be out at uh, Seven Figure MSP next week and then yes. at MSP GeekCon starting Sunday. And then I'll take a few days off and take a long Memorial Day weekend. So I think I'm taking like five or six days off there from. Okay, Memorial good. Day. Maybe maybe enjoy the, the weather on the Eastern Shore. I might sleep in so. once or twice, yeah. Yes, good for you. Good for you. Okay, so I want to talk about how, how did you initially start this? I know you said it was born out of necessity in your own MSP, and then it kind of spun off as its own company. And then you had business partners that were running that while you were running the MSP. How did you find those business partners? How did you you know, combine that, that whole set yeah. of business. I mean, I think uh, it, it, a lot of, some of that just goes to dumb luck. Um, it was a problem I knew I had. It had been actually really painful for me that day because I had spent hours trying to put together a presentation for a QBR I was doing the following day. And I left work at, I don't know, three o'clock or something, drove out into Eastern Shore, Maryland and played volleyball in a little gym in the middle of nowhere in Denton, Maryland. And uh, as we're leaving the gym, somebody who I've been playing against for 25 years um, came up to me and said, Hey, you know, you do something with computers. Right. And I went, well, yeah, kind of. And, uh, and she says, you know, I've got a couple developers and we're looking for a problem to solve. And we're in the ed tech space today. We'd like to go do something else. We're looking to start a, a business. I said, well, I, I'm an MSP. I got all kinds of problems, but let me tell you about the one that annoyed me today. And we talked about it and it turns out these guys were, um, business analytics and reporting nerds from their former life, like they were used to writing this kind of software and their skill set just naturally transitioned right into this. So oh, wow. it was just kind of meant to be. Um, and so we sat down and talked about it and, you know, we had the discussions and you know, we, th there was that uncomfortable moment where everybody on the call went, well, okay, we got to talk about it. Who's going to be the CEO? And I think everybody sighed a sigh of relief when I went, I don't have time for this crap. Like one of you guys got to do it. And, and I went back to work. Um, and, and that's just kind of how it happened. So. I love it. 
Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, so let's talk about this journey. Um, when, when you sold your MSP, you went over to life, life, life cycle insights, was the plan to scale it and sell it? Was the plan to scale it and start acquiring other companies? Like what, what was the, the evil genius? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't know that there was any genius, but from the beginning, our plan was to build something that that could provide an exit. Um, you know, we're, none of us are 20 years old anymore. Um, you know, I'm about middle of the pack for the age of my of my team. Um, everybody's at that point where we're looking at, you know, what does retirement look like? How do we make yeah. sure everything everything's taken care of? So the plan was always to build it and sell it. Um, the plan was to build it and sell it in three years. Um, whether that was realistic or not, I mean, I don't know that any of us had an idea. It turned out to be three and a half and everything worked out, but, um, you know, it could have taken us five at the end of the day. I think we held on a little longer to make sure we got the right deal with the right folks. Um, you know, we talked to everybody in the channel that just happens as you go through this journey, but, um, same as going as selling your MSP, you know, over the last five years, I think I had seriously talked to four or five people, um, none of it ever turned up anything until the day when it did. And, and this wasn't much different than that. You know, it was when, when we finally did our deal with Scalepad, I think we'd been talking to them for a year and a half. You know, they were the, the friendly competitor that we talked to semi-regularly. So I know the startup that I was a part of, well, we actually structured the company so that it could be acquired specifically by Continuum. Like we did the same thing. We kind of identified three to five companies that we we could see us partnering with or getting absorbed by, getting acquired by. And then we had a, a few on the list of like, we just don't see that being a cultural fit, you know, don't have the same um, whatever, workflow habits, whatever it is. So we structured the company in such a way that it could be folded into Continuum very easily, and it was. We so built our UI it, so it could be folded very easily into one, one or two of the big players, and that wasn't who bought us, so whoops. Interesting. Uh, interesting. The best laid plans, right? Yeah. So so what about like um, cultural fit? So I hear that a lot with MSPs yeah. being acquired. How much did that play a factor as you were having these conversations for the last few years? What did it become obvious? Like, let's not go with ABC Co because they yeah. just don't, they, they, we don't mesh. Well, at the end of the day, and, and we didn't see this coming when we started, we built ourselves a, a and I'm, I'm going to say, use, use the wrong words here, but a following in the MSP space, right? We have mm -hmm. some MSPs who really love and adore us. Um, they've been great to us. And our culture was always one of, we'll come meet you where, where you are, we'll teach, we'll educate, we'll uplift. We've built a community around this product. And to see that go somewhere where we felt like that wouldn't be appreciated and, and nurtured um, wouldn't have been acceptable to us. Uh, so that ruled some people out. Um, at the end of the day, what it came down to was really as much cultural fit as product fit, because we knew that we weren't done building we were, you know, halfway through, we were, there were still things that we wanted to achieve. There were still things we wanted to see built and we didn't want to see it go somewhere where it just sat on a shelf. So the fact that it would go somewhere where the vision was similar, even if not identical and things would get completed, that was big to me. Um, Cause I think this space needs all the help in the world. Having been an MSP, yep. um, it was just important to me to make sure that, that things got mm -hmm. finished. So you you hinted at this, but how how much of a factor did it play into your decision to sell to Scalepad to make sure that your clients were taken care of? It was huge. Um, there there were at least two organizations that we just kind of blackballed right off the top, and we're like, you know, um, we can't see ourselves working there during an earnout, and we can't see our partners um, being happy with that, um, you know, in the end. I love it. So, yeah. so there's a cultural fit. There's the desire for your your team and your clients to be taken care of. I want to talk about roadmap. So, obviously, you know, th this is a conversation that happens. You said for about a year, year and a half, and in the meantime, you are continuing to grow Lifecycle Insights. You're continuing to have your your dev plans. You've got you know things on the horizon. So, when you get acquired obviously the company that just acquired you has their own dev roadmap for multiple solutions, multiple tools, and somehow they all need to be integrated and continue to push them forward and, yeah. and help them to grow. How, how does that happen? Who makes those decisions? Is there yeah. a, a wrestling tournament that happens off camera somewhere? Like, what does that look like? There is some, there's definitely some jockeying that happens, but at the end of the day, 
Um, bigger decisions like how we fold this whole thing together will happen, you know, 10, 12 months down the road. The first thing today is, can we bill everybody out of one platform, right? Sure. I mean, the big thing is, can everybody still get paid? Can everybody still, can we still swipe credit cards, provide services, keep our customers up and running right. and make this invisible to them? Yeah, because so, revenue has to be there. <laughs> well, and we're just not past the phase of let's not screw anything up for our existing customers, right? That's yeah. the, the, the number one thing is land the plane, right? Then we can figure out how to work on it. Yeah. Um, so, so we're still in land the, land the plane stage. We've done, we did unified billing and got all of that set up before we made the announcement actually, um, which was actually pretty cool. Um, you know, Scalepad acquired three companies in the same three month period. So um, I think they acquired them all within like 45 days of each other. But, um, you know, this stuff gets announced as we roll one out, celebrate it a little bit, roll the next one out, celebrate it a little bit, give marketing to, a, a chance to work on it. And, and right, such. give them a chance to breathe a little. Give everybody a chance to breathe, get, like, let everybody heal from their whiplash, right? Um, so, you know, they announced Control Map first, then Cognition 360, and then us. Um, so they've gotten to talk about all the exciting things. And, but at the end of the day, I think what we have to come to terms with, and we still haven't completely answered that is what does the long-term product vision look like, right. right? There's a logical, if you just pick apart what Scalepad owns, right? You've got their traditional product, which was um, asset lifecycle management, right? From, from birth to warranty renewal to they've just added um, asset IT asset disposal so they can ship you a box. You can put a label on it, ship your old laptop back. They'll give you a certificate of destruction. They properly recycle the equipment so it doesn't land in a landfill and they plant a tree out in you know deforested California or something like that for you. Um, great, they cradle to grave. We can do IT asset management. They have some other things in that product, but that's the core of what it does and does really well. Everybody thought we overlapped with that a ton, but really our only overlap with them was warranty lookups to figure out how old things were, right? When was it purchased? How old is it? We step in and do the client deliverable. So we give you a suite of reports that you can go to your client and say, this is your budget. This is your forecast. This is your roadmap. This is how we get from the risk assessment we ran today to the end of the roadmap. And this is how we pay for it in between. And that's something that nobody had really done in this space was real true IT budgeting. Everybody says, I don't know how you get a customer to say yes. Well, you go show them they can afford it. Right. <laughs> Not that hard. Uh, so, so we delivered that to the space. But then uh, a lot of folks looked at our risk assessment module and said, I need to do complex compliance work. I need to do SOC 2. I need to do CMMC. I need to do this bigger thing. We were shoehorning some of that into our product and trying to figure out how we were going to grow it to be able to handle some of that. Scalp had bought control map right? Which is a logical like, hey, you outgrew delivering the executives the reports. Let's move you into the big boy product that lets you capture evidence, do the, the real-time um, you know, alignment stuff, and actual, actually do compliance properly. Um, so now you can see Scalepad Cradle to Grave has this, this nice string of IT asset management, uh, deliverable reports in the middle, and this high-end compliance thing. And, and you can start to see a long-term vision of um, all of their data sources, uh, fed into the reports that we can put out to customers. And let's not forget Cognition 360, who builds dashboards and customer views and all this other stuff. Um, and then from the other end, pulling data out of like a control map and saying, hey, Mr. C-level executive who has no care about the compliance journey, you're 85% of the way there. Good job, right? And being able to dumb that down to Crayola reports and just regular yes. green, are we on track? Are we off track? And give the executives the level of view that they need to have. So when you look at how those products tie together, like there was some genius that went into what they bought, why they bought it, how it all how it all fits. And at the end of the day, that's going to lead to much more success for our product, no matter what the end roadmap really looks like. Our customers are going to have that complete solution on the account management side. We're not acquired by somebody whose job is to sell RMM agents or, you know, the next cybersecurity widget. Right. Um, you know, we're, we're in a place where we fit. And, and, yes. and that's what I think a lot of people didn't see. They saw... The market looked at us and said Scalepad and Lifecycle are competitors because they have this little tiny 15% overlap. And in reality, um, there's some overlap we got to figure out how to deal with. But in reality, this is a, and we hate these words, but there, this is a better together. This is a complementary scenario. Right. I love it. I'm so glad you shared that because sometimes you see these acquisitions happening in the channel and they do happen with great regularity. Oh, yeah. And sometimes I just scratch my head and I'm like, I'm I'm sure someone has a strategic vision. Like I, they, you don't just go acquiring it or selling, you know, there's always a reason, but it's not always explained. And so, so, well, and I, always, think, you know. <laughs> I think sometimes there is a difference between strategic vision to build an outcome, which I think is what Scalepad is doing, yes. 
and strategic vision to build a book of sales that you can resell later, which is what tip, typical PE does. The right. things don't have to be related. I can just scoop them all up, put them under one umbrella, make my revenue look like it's really big and shove it yes. off on somebody else. And yes. I, that does happen in this space. Yes. So this, sometimes that is the strategy. The strategy is, the strategy is, is a, a revenue grab. <laughs> and that's when a product goes somewhere to die and not get invested in. And that's what we're trying to avoid. I love that. I love the vision, you know, of that scale pad had, and then that, that you and the founders had as you were um, growing this. And so I want to talk a little bit about that, like the goal setting and the success habits. What is it that made, uh, made you so successful? Now, obviously great product, um, hole in the marketplace, like, but, but beyond that. Oh, that's dumb luck, right? You build the right thing at the right time and, and rocket fuel happens. Yes. Um, but but it was definitely a hole in the marketplace. Like we had product market fit. Um, but I think the other thing was um, we really, we, we had a few core values that really stood out. Um, creating Raven fans and being transparent were two of our core values that just landed in this marketplace where everybody feels like they're not heard by the, by the big companies they work with. They're stuck in ticket systems where support responds when they get around to it. Um, I had a guy on the phone the other day and he's like, oh, you know, I got, I was on a Zoom call with him. He's like, oh, I got a problem. I said, well, that's one I can't fix for you. Put in a support ticket. We're going to be on the phone for 20 more minutes. And by the time you're done, you probably have an answer from them. Oh, and uh, and literally- What a breath of fresh air. And when we're getting off the, off the call, he goes, oh, I got an email from your support team three minutes ago. I didn't see it come in. And, uh, you know, so so delivering on support in this channel is a lost art. And I, I was talking to Bobby Jacobs over at Thread and the stuff that Thread is doing around finding ways to be frictionless to work with, right? Yes. And they're doing it for the MSP. On the vendor side, we had to figure out how to do that. And we Correct. did it through making our C-level team ex uh, you know, accessible. Marnie and I do two, three, four open group webinars a week or open group calls a week. We have right after this, I'm going to Lifecycle Insights open office hours. We've been doing them for three years. Every single week, we might have canceled one here and there for an IT nation or something. But, sure. But but every week, one of our top two customer facing C level executives is on that call. Right. I love it. Where else can I you go to that. find that? Right? right. And so, and and MSPs more than once have come to us and said, "I'm amazed that now that you have 800, 900, 1,000 partners, you two still make time to come out and do these things." Right. And that's how you know when it's a core value. It's not just a, a lip service. Oh, we love our customers. Well, like nobody's going to have on their website a core value that says, we hate our customers. Please right. never call us. Every time you call me, I complain. But sometimes you wonder if that's what happens behind the scenes, even while the, the customer-centric website says, we love our customers. It's like, well sorry, like Visa, but I would never know that you love me because you put me through a phone tree and I can't talk to a human. Well, you and if you think me. about it, <laughs> and if you think about this, and this is one of the challenges we have at ScalePad right now, you acquire a bunch of companies, go read five companies' websites, you won't find the same core values. Hmm. So now we have the challenge of bringing together separate teams. And ScalePad has been very clear about it. They said, look, you had some core values that landed, like you guys nailed it. Um, and, and they've, they've, they're very clear about the fact that they want our leadership team to stay, um, to, to, to show them what we did to, to bring that, that culture to their team. And it takes a lot of self-awareness to look in the mirror and go, this is, this is somebody who we're kind of friendly competitors with kind of, sort of like the industry sees more crossover than we do, but I see that they have this raving fan base and, we, we need to learn that from them. Hmm. And that's impressive, right? They do yeah. a lot of things better than we do. They have, they have salespeople. We never had salespeople. Uh, they do a lot of things better than we do. And there's a lot you of have salespeople. They just happen to be um, in the C-suite. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty much it. Um, and so, you know, there, there was a, it was just really impressive to see people humble enough to say, there's something we can learn from this little company that's one one fifteenth our size or whatever the number was. I don't know, but but this company who's a fraction of us, there's something we can learn from the team that built that, oh, and cool. and they believe that it, it it wasn't lip service until they bought us and disappeared. Um, you know, all four of our owners are still there, um, not by not because we're locked into some long term earnout or something. We're all still there because we believe in what they're building and and we enjoy what we're doing. And so far, we've gotten to work with all cool people. Um, and they haven't fired me yet. So we're still here. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Okay. So I want to take a step into the boardroom and just have a couple of conversations. The first, I want to key in your raving fans core value. Mm -hmm. So um, 
you had a marketing campaign that was super gutsy. And I think Marnie came up with it. It was about, it was, I, I hate life cycle insights. Life cycle insights, that sucks. Yes. Life cycle insights sucks. Okay. So that was mine. I, oh, that she, was almost, yours. she almost okay. didn't let me do that. She almost <laughs> okay. kiboshed that one. Yeah. I, I think it's, it's got to be one of the most brilliant. I mean, don't, don't, you know. So I stole it. It wasn't my original idea. Have you ever heard of but, Steven Singer Jewelers in Philly? Yes. So he has billboards that say, I hate Steven Singer. And it's the yes. husband complaining about his wife spending at Steven Singer. Right? Yes. I saw that and thought, what can we do with that? <sighs> right. And so we turned it into that. And uh, we even got Lifecycle Insights. Socks. Right. And, uh, you know, we bought the domain for Lifecycle Insights. Socks. We put up a bunch of fake reviews. All the, They're all one star reviews. Like ever since I started using Lifecycle Insights, I'm closing more business and I got kicked into the next tax bracket. Thanks a lot. Yes. Yeah. Um, you know, a bunch of that kind of stuff. And, uh, and it was, we, we went to it nation with t-shirts that said lifecycle insights.io and the .io was like spray painted out and dot sucks was like spray painted on them. So, you know, we, we carried that, but, but at the end of the day, you know, we were, we knew we were the underdog. We knew we were brand new and we had a pretty ambitious goal of get from zero to, to exit pretty quickly. So at that point we had to look at it and say, we ha you have to do something a little daring. You have to be a little out there. You have to, you have to make noise. Yeah. And I joke with everybody. I'm like, my job should have been chief noisemaker because yes. literally that is, that is the goal of a channel chief. That's, that's what you got to do. You got to go stand up on stage. And, and, and I delivered a, a, um, a, 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 a um, breakout session at IT nation that year. That was how to deliver a QBR that sucks. Nice. That's right. I remember that right? you tied it all in and, and 185 people showed up for that, for that session. So let's, so take, take a step back to the boardroom. You're having the conversation. You come up with this idea. You're like, it's brilliant. I, you know, we did a swipe and deploy from the jewelry store. They've got billboards all over. Look how successful it is. Was, was it difficult to get sign off on that because of the core value? Because it, it felt like it was friction. Or I, don't was it, I don't think it challenged the core value. Cause I think the customers who aligned with us knew we were a little quirky and having fun the whole time. Right. Yeah. I mean, our, our marketing is full of stupid puns and uh, you know, goofy memes and we're just having a good time at it. Yes. But I think, no, the problem was bigger that um, we didn't want to go so far that people didn't take us seriously. Okay. And so okay, we almost didn't do it because we didn't want to tarnish our brand with this, with this thing that somebody could take the wrong way. Mm. Um, and so we, we hemmed and hawed on that one for a good bit before we finally said, you know what, we think we can do it and control it and deliver something that really speaks to the message we want to deliver, which is there are going to be different outcomes when you use the tool and use it right. And some of them are going to create challenges for you. You're going to sell more. You're going to bring out, bring on more new business, which means you have to hire people. It means yeah. you have to pay an accountant to, to figure out how to not pay all your taxes. You know, you got to do some of these things in order to, and so we, we really wanted to make that transparent. But at the end of the day, we also realized that we had to be fun and quirky to be uh, authentic. Yes. And, and that was something that, but wasn't one of our core values, but it was, it wasn't one of our documented core values. But there was no doubt with the humans in our company that we were going to be who we are and just go have fun. And if you've been to a Robin Robbins event and seen Marnie you know, dressed up as a as a circus juggler or whatever, you know, um, you've seen me on stage at a seven figure event dressed as Captain Obvious, like, you know, <laughs> we're going to go out and have fun and we're going to just we're going to, to have fun with it. Um, you can take life way too serious. This is a hard business and MSPs have a ton on their plate. If you can help them have a little bit of fun along the journey, it lightens it up. And excuse me, you can do that without forgetting to add value, right? Yes. So as long oh, as the way usually. along the way, it's, yeah. it was always find a way to have this deliverable at the end that is, here's a thing you can pick up and take with you. And that comes from Marnie being a, a doctorate of education, having a doctorate in education. Um, but you know, everything we did was, and everything we still do is when you walk away from this, you'll take a worksheet, you'll take a, a an action item. You'll it will give you a thing you can take back into your business and achieve. And, uh, that just set us apart too. And I was a corporate trainer before I was an IT guy, but it definitely was, was Marnie's, uh, you know, right. Her bailiwick for sure. Yes. Uh, was being able to, to deliver that education culture through the company. I love that unofficial KPI of, of having fun. Yeah. Uh, one of my mentors actually asks his team monthly at the at the end of the month or beginning of the month, he has a, a like an end of month survey 
And he asks about client and client success and, you know, initiatives and mental health and things like that. But the, and the questions change every single month. But the one question he always asks is on a scale of one to 10, with 10 being the best, how yeah. much fun are you having? And he said, when it drops below six, he's like, all right, we're having a problem because we're yeah. working awfully hard. And if we're working, and, and yes, we have to work awfully hard because we're growing businesses and running a business is hard and growing a business is hard. But if we're not having fun while we're doing it, then what's the point? Well, and there's the things you don't think about, right? You start a SaaS business and you go, great, I'm going to market to all the MSPs in the US and Canada. You put it out on the internet and you're there for six months. And one day somebody logs in with a .za address and you go, what the heck is that? Oh, oh. I have a client in South Africa now, <laughs> right? And then you get one in uh, in New Zealand and then you get one in, in uh, Australia and all of a sudden you're in every time zone and your website chat's pinging at 11 o'clock at night and you've got clients wanting onboardings at nine o'clock at night and at five o'clock in the morning and before you know it like this goes from a hey we're going to work 40 hours a week 50 hours a week maybe we're workaholics and we'll work 70 holy crap we never get to turn off and nice. we used to joke that between Marnie and I, and she's a super morning person and I'm a super late night person, we used to joke that between the two of us, we offered about 20 hours a, a day of support. Um, but our support team was, was just ravenous at it too. Like if people could reach out to our support team at you know seven o'clock on a Sunday and they'd get an answer same day. Wow. And so some of that is just, you know, we had a large um, ownership team. We launched this with four partners. Um, you get four grownups on the cap table who all know and understand their job and, and agree on some of those core values and, and want to deliver. Um, you know, you get four real business professionals rowing in the same direction and you can kick a lot of ass is really what it boils down to. I love it. Yeah. Um, all right. I want to talk about, I want to go back to the boardroom. Uh, we were talking in the green room before we went live about the emotional side of selling your business. Yeah. Um, and, and Jameson West has a great book. You were saying it's great. I've never read it. I need yeah, to get back that. It on the bookshelf. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So, um, how, how did that happen? Like how, what, what kind of thoughts and feelings went through your head? I mean, you're, you're six months past goal, but did you feel like, wait, maybe we're not quite there yet? Like how did I, you I absolutely wrestle felt like we weren't that? there. Um, yeah. I, I, I was the no vote on the team, um, uh, even up to the point at which we sold. Um, but at the same day, at the same point, you're on a team with the team and you do what's right for the team. Um, I wasn't done building. I wanted to build some more things. And, and so far, scale pads, uh, you know, all signs point to that we're still going to get to build some cool things. But um, but at the end of the day, you know, you get together with a team, you set a goal, you achieve your goal. You, you, you kind of do what you promised to do in the beginning. Right. Um, and that, again, is about having some culture, having some ethics and doing the right thing at the end of the day. Um, you know, what kind of person would I be if I went to my team and said, eh, I'm not ready yet. You guys stick around for another year because I'm I'm not bored yet. Right. Right. But you're you know, never going to be done building. You're never there's done. Never right? going to be a bigger. You, there's always another problem to solve. There's always, especially right? if you are, if you own this damaged, build a better mousetrap brain that I've been mm. stuck with. Right. I mean, you know, some people are just never there, and I'm, I'm right. one of them. I'm never there. So, yes. you know, I've turned over some of those ideas to Scalepad and said, hey, you know, I think this is the next thing we should build. There's a logical extension here. We could do this and this, and you know, the, the process is a little slower with a larger organization with more, you know, more 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 people involved and more process and things like that but um at the end of the day they also have way more resources to crank it out faster when we get to the point where they say yep this is something that's going to move so um but it was tough it, it's hard um it was easier than selling my msp i think because we went into it knowing there was going to be an exit hmm. you know, when you start the msp it's like 10 years in and you're like well i guess i'm going to do this until i'm 65 and hopefully i can sell it for enough money to retire right um and you know, it it really was a surprise to me to sell the MSP, and and I even pushed back on the guy that that bought it, um, and you know, trying to make sure that he would take care of my team and that things certain things would be done, and I almost ruined the deal on it, and uh, and finally he sat down with me and went, look, this is either going to happen or it's not, but you you know, obviously you're struggling with this a little bit, and that's the point at which I went and bought Jameson's book and decided to read it because it because selling the first business kind of tore me up a little bit, and. Um, and at the end of the day, he took amazing care of all my people. Um, a couple of them have moved on since, but uh, you know, the, he he did wonderful by my people. And he lost one of my customers in an entire in the in the transition. And it was a guy who was like three hours away who only worked there because I was there. So it, it was the best transition you could ask for. But That's I had myself so worked up about it on the emotional side that I was going to screw it up. 
Yes. Um, uh. And so, so it is, it's, it's tough. Like you build something that is, um, it, it's incredibly personal, right? You've taken a lot, a, a large portion of, of your life and invested in it on the software side, especially in this business. I had taken a lot of my process and methodology and the way I present things. I've taken my sales craft, yes, built it into a product. It said, if you present my way, your life will be easier. And, and not enough people really put two and two together on that. When they look at it, they go, oh, it's brilliant how you guys do this. And well, that was literally my sales craft at my MSP. It was, right. you know, we can't, we can't go convince a customer. If you go, if I go visit my customer every six months and shake my cup with my black sunglasses on and ask for money, um, you know, um, Carl Bickmore says they used to call him two buck Carl because he would show up and he'd want him to buy one more agent or one more thing or one more, you know, and, and that just doesn't work. And right. so what you've got to do is risk assessment, some, some gap analysis. This is, these are the places where you have exposure. Here's your budget. Um, you know, we can only spend every dollar once. We're not the federal government. Let's make sure that we can solve for the problems that we have. And then these are the remediations we'd like you to take if you want to be in a better place than you are today. And if you have a 50 cent problem and it's a $20,000 answer, you're probably going to check this little box that says acceptable risk and move on. Right. And, you know, that methodology, as we've exposed it to more and more MSPs, they go, I don't feel like a dirty sales guy anymore. I don't ever have to say anything gross. And it, I literally can just go out and meet with my customers and I can go build raving fans and my business is easier. No, so, I love, love the you know, alignment. But yeah, you pour great. all that into a business and 15 years of, of your experience doing it as an MSP, your entire adult life of being a sales guy, at, you know, an auto dealer, a cell phone store, everywhere else in between. And it's a little emotional to let go of it, right? It's a, it's a lot to turn that over to the next person. Yes. So, so you want to make sure you turn it over to somebody who's going to do right by it. So I want to talk about the last six months leading yeah. into the, the ink being dry. Yeah. It, it's a goal. So your goal was to sell in three years. That goal has come and gone. The mm -hmm. calendar days yeah. are ticking by. It's also a goal that you don't really control, which like totally breaks the yeah. rules. Like you're not supposed to set a goal that you don't control, but right. you're, you're kind of controlling it. Um, kind of, yeah. What what are what do those six months do to you from a mindset standpoint? I'm sure they made Marnie way more crazy than they did me because I was <laughs> um, I we were the, the the downside was we didn't want to go hire ten people because um, you know we were, we knew we were going to exit and whatever happened we wanted we did we didn't want to hire people and then go oh tomorrow you don't you might might oh be God. here you might not be right, right. so we were really burning the midnight oil um we were there was a lot of tension over just how much work there was how how, how little anybody was sleeping how little anybody saw their their families yeah. um, our support team was was just absolute at an absolute grind um i would have i i would have had, had i had my way um you know gone out and hired some people and stuck around a little longer but at the end it was you know we were all on the same page i i knew that i was the outlier and that i wasn't the the type to go out and try and submarine this thing um, so the hardest part of the last six months was really trying to figure out how do you get from where you are to where you're going when you're growing at 10% a month and you've got 800 customers, right? right. So that 10% a month growth just starts, it's that snowball is getting bigger and bigger and bigger every month. It's coming at you faster and faster. And there's so much to juggle. Yeah. And we thought the day we, uh, I thought, um, I think my business partners had been through enough SaaS acquisitions that they knew what we were going to be up against a little better than I did. I thought when we sold, life would be all right, everything would be easy, we'd be able to hand some things off. And the amount of time it takes to unwind some of those things and hand them off, um, this has been a little longer than I thought it would be. Um, we're still in the process. And um, you know, I have regular meetings with folks on the ScalePad team to, how can we lighten your calendar? How can we give you a few more minutes back in your day? How can we give you a little more sanity back in your day? Yeah. Uh, and they've been great. They're they're wonderful to deal with, but it takes a while to get people up to speed on how to demo your product so they can take demos off your plate, how to onboard customers and teach them more complex things so they can take a little of that off your plate. Um, and they're doing I, two other roll-ups at the same time, really. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and so they had to hire people at the, at the executive level just to manage these three acquisitions that are coming at them all at the same time. Like it's, it's been really interesting to watch as an organization, how they've, how they've put this together and pulled it off. But um, yeah. So cool. 
can we compare and contrast, and this will probably be the last question because we're going to run out of time, but compare and contrast the, the sale of your MSP um, to the sale of Lifecycle Insights from a, from a speed to, you know, from, from baby business to acquisition. What were those two timetables like? Um, how were well, you I owned the MSP it? for 16 and a half years. Yeah. And in the beginning, I was just some immature punk kid who was bad at working for anybody else and computers were fun. So I was fixing computers in an office in a little tiny town called Dover, Delaware. And uh, and it wasn't a real business. It was a hobby, right? And it was probably 2008 before I really turned that into a real business, but I still owned it for, what, uh, 12 years after that. All right, um, let's park there for a second. What was the shift? How did you shift from managers. hobby... Okay, so when you adopted managed services, that's when the switch flipped. Okay. Well, at that point, I had bigger recurring monthly bills, and I had I had to grow up and treat it like a business instead of a uh -huh. hobby, right? Yeah. When all you're paying is fifteen hundred bucks rent, and uh, you know the electric and the cable bill, and one or two employees, it's pretty easy to when when all of a sudden the bills start to stack up. You have these systems in place that are supposed to automate and do cool things. Yeah. Um. You know the 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 drive to treat it like something a little bit more important. Just just showed up. I don't know it, uh, but but that was the that was the catalyst really in in making that difference. And it was five guys in a basement in Ohio building a SaaS company that called Lab Tech. Um, you know, I found their tool. I it got super involved in their forums and things like that. And and that that kind of was my catalyst to build it into a real business. Mm. Um, but it still okay, took so me twelve years to build it into anything worth selling. Yeah. yeah. So sixteen years for that one, three and a half for this one. Was it because you had four executives who were adults and rowing in the same direction, or what do you attribute that the pace difference? Um, certainly the partnership. Um, you know, the four of the right partners with the right skill sets. Right. We had two developers on the cap table. Okay. Um, Arnie and I understood go to market very very well. Um. A lot of it I attribute to the experience I got at the MSP, and you can't get that experience in 15 minutes. You know, that, nice. it was the experience of a lifetime that made the last three years possible. And so, you know, I, I don't think I could have done the SaaS business without being able to sit across the table from an MSP and say, I know and understand your pain, and here's how we can solve some of it because I've been there. Mm -hmm. uh, the SaaS business would have been way harder. Yeah. Uh, had I not been through, been down that journey. And I know guys who are running SaaS businesses who didn't come from here and I see their struggle and some of them are doing really, really well. I'm not convinced I would have done really, really well not having come from there and, and seen and understood where these guys are coming from. Right, just even simply articulating the messaging and what is the problem that I solve is yeah. so difficult if you've yeah. never walked a mile in the MSP's shoes. Yeah. Uh, I had a conversation with a brand new startup a few days ago and I... First of all, it took him about 20 minutes until I understand what his product was, until I understood what his product was. And then I'm like, so the problem you're solving is X. And I said, are you okay if I'm blunt with you? I'm like, I don't think the MSPs are looking to solve that problem. Well, I was then wrong. No, you're wrong. They really do want to solve that. And I'm like, I talk to a whole lot of MSPs and none of them, like, they complain about a lot of other things and they have very real business challenges. Not that one. Yeah. <laughs> so, but if you've never been an MSP, you don't know that. Of course, it's your baby, and nobody has an ugly baby. Right. Um, it's it's tough. So, I think that yeah. that was a huge um, plus in your corner. So you had adult, yeah, absolutely, you know, market fit, like right. And I had and yeah. I had made some connections. You know, I knew the I had been to the ConnectWise events. I had been to ConnectWise um, peer group, the local user groups, or whatever. Like our beta testers were my ConnectWise local user group. Love um, so, you know, it was easier to get into the market when you already knew people, you knew the events, you knew the people and places to go. Um, I didn't know nearly as many as I know now, somehow in the last three and a half years, I've met 20 times as many folks, but how about that? <laughs> but I had a lot of contacts. Um, mm -hmm. so that, that was kind of the, the initial catalyst was, Hey, we know we can go to IT nation, you know, 200 people will walk past the right. booth and hopefully we'll sell something. Amazing. Um, yeah. I love it. Well, thank you so much for your time. I love having these candid conversations and um, digging in a little bit more than, yeah. than just what is on the surface with a press release. And um, obviously great news and congratulations to you and the thank entire you. team. But um, I love it. Thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate it. It's been a wild ride and we're looking forward to some more of it. So I'm actually off to go speak to one of our mutual friends, Mr. John Harden. Oh, amazing. Yeah. Give him yeah, my address. Gonna... 
He I will. He, he's going to come hang out with our Life Cycle Insights group for our thir- for our Friday afternoon uh, open office hours. We'll make it happen. I love and it. We're going to talk about SaaS management. So, oh, so thank you so much for having me. I look forward to doing it again. Take care, Jennifer. Thanks. Take care. Thanks.